I'm on the last leg of my B road journey between London and Glasgow. People nowadays just miss everything. We just miss so many beautiful things that are just, uh, you know, literally maybe five minutes from the motorway. But look at this, this is just heaven. On this part of my epic trip, I'll be following in one of my hero's footsteps, racing a high-speed power boat. He's right out of the water, look at that. Jeez, oh. <laughs> I'll be getting to grips with a beautiful redhead. Chill, girl. Chill, girl. And kissing goodbye to a massive landmark. Let it go. Whoa, look at whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Finally, I'll be in a curry kitchen, finding the true meaning of hot. <laughs> As I avoid the motorways, I'll be visiting the Lake District, Northumbria, and finishing off in my home city of Glasgow. The genteel British countryside. Peaceful and unchanging, its serenity broken only by the birds, the lambs, the cattle, and the farmers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you <laughs> Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling. Just how this local farmer's sport came about is a bit of a mystery. What we do know is that it was around when the Vikings were here and it's still going strong today. Also, it involves legalized violence, so naturally, I'm on the case. Cumbria. In days gone by, the Romans, the Celts, the Angles, and the Norsemen all resorted to battering each other for control of this rich and varied landscape. The invaders may have gone, but local families keep up the fighting tradition. I'm meeting Trevor Hodgson and his daughter Tracy at their farm in the Dent Valley. You can see how I was built for this rugged environment, can't you? Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Trevor is a lifelong devotee of Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling, even schooling his daughter Tracy in the techniques. It is a farming sport, isn't it? Most of the people be farming. I think it is. So I think big, all, broad lads just... They're all farming connections yeah. somewhere on the line. Yeah. They were happy to give me an impromptu demo of how it's done right here in the barn. You shake and then you take hold. And it's right. right arm under. Right. And then you get the grass. I'm glad I'm not resting you, sir. <laughs> the aim is simple. Get your opponent on the ground without breaking your hold or your neck. I'm thought of as being a man with big hands. It's like toys. <laughs> All her dad's training has made Tracy an expert. She's won nearly every competition going and has the medals to prove it. That's one I got at Walsingham Show. Uh, and then that's my centenary one. <laughs> you're very, very good, aren't you? <laughs> Do people get hurt? Um, I've seen a couple of wrestlers get hurt, really? yeah. Have you ever been hurt? Yeah. Really? What did one happen? In me last year, yeah. my knee went pop. It sounds a pretty tough sport, all right. Tracy is involved in a big annual contest today, and I want to see the action at first hand. And while I'm here, I'm going to try and get to the bottom of who introduced the locals to such savagery by meeting up with wrestling historian Roger Robson. People usually say, oh, it's a Viking sport. Yes. And, and there are all sorts of things which um, support that in a way. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what I come down to in the end is that wrestling is such a natural activity. That, the boys, that, that, boys do it all the time, I know, don't yeah. they? The place which has the nearest style of wrestling to ours is Sardinia, in the mountains of Sardinia. Is that right? Sistrumpa. And, and there they are, backhold wrestling, same rules, exactly. Those rules are surprisingly simple. First, you must link your fingers behind the back of your opponent. The contest, which always takes place on grass, is then decided by the best of three falls. And if the handhold is broken, that also counts as a fall. But enough of the do's and don'ts. Why does everyone wear those bizarre embroidered trunks? He seems to have the album cover of Tubular Bells sewn in his arse, which I think he deserves some kind of prize for. In fact, they're all rather proud of their costumes. They even have competitions for the best dressed wrestler, with very enthusiastic judges. You don't often see two middle-aged women wandering around in a field looking at boys' underpants, do you? I don't know why, it seems such fun. 
It was the Victorians who introduced the colourful pants. The beautiful embroidery is a way to mark each wrestler out. Much better than just a number on your back, I think. This is a real family sport, sometimes spanning many generations, and there's a lot of pride at stake. In about every single family around here has got somebody who's going to go in for this, or has done, or was the dad of somebody in there. Over in the women's section, Tracy's made it to the last bout. This is the final. Yeah. Well, good luck, good luck. Well, here you go. Show no mercy, girl. It's fantastic to see something so good natured and competitive at the same time. It's a great combination. The girls don't wear the costumes. For once, they don't bother getting dressed up. Nope, they're only here for the violence. So very different from the women's wrestling you see in Los Angeles, for example. It involves a lot of kind of jelly unpleasantness. Oh, lovely. At the end of it all, Tracy triumphs yet again. Well done, you. We get a prize. We get something more for that shelf that's about to fall off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and so the tradition here carries on, just as it has for hundreds of years. That was a very nice day. What's really interesting about the idea of people doing something for hundreds of years and nobody's quite sure where it started or what it's really about is that if you do these things for long enough, the habit becomes sort of who you are, which is quite an interesting idea, I think. I'm now heading deeper into the Lake District, over Kirkstone Pass, the highest road pass in England. I can hardly keep my eyes on the road. It is truly stunning here. Round every bend and over each hill lies yet another breathtaking view. There are a total of 14 major lakes in this spectacular national park, and it was on one of them, Coniston, that a childhood hero of mine met his end. In January 1967, so Donald Campbell was attempting to break his own world water speed record. But as he hit an estimated 328 miles per hour, his boat, Bluebird, lifted out of the lake. It somersaulted into the air and then hit the water again, tragically killing Sir Donald on impact. Forty years on, his daughter Gina remembers it all vividly. I'm still just convinced it was the sheer speed. She started to move. Yeah. Just a bit, so we saw the little shoes, she went from one to the other and she took off and you know, she went over 300 foot in the air. This monolithic boat taking off like a jet and doing this huge, big backward somersault. You know, a few degrees more, she could have almost re-landed. Yeah. My father died at the wheel of his boat. That's how heroes live, that's how heroes died. This time Campbell's holding her in, a mere 190, but still a long way over the record. Gina certainly has something to be proud of. Her father held seven world water speed records. And it seems Sir Donald really was that suave James Bond-like character most of us men would secretly like to be. He always said he wanted to die making love to a beautiful woman. I say he died at the hands of a beautiful bird. Well, my ambition is to be shot by a jealous husband when I'm 94. Why do you want to wait till then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on an epic B-road journey from London to Glasgow, and I've reached the spectacular shores of Lake Windermere. Power boating has been hugely popular here ever since the days when Sir Donald Campbell was breaking records, and traditionally the lake has resonated with the deafening sound of big engines. But inevitably, times change, and conservationists and nature lovers finally got the boats banned. The Windermere Power Boat Racing Club fought for years to keep their tradition alive, but in 2001, club president Ted Walsh had to admit defeat. We're not allowed to race here anymore. The National Park Authority decided that uh, the National Park is not to be seen to be used by powered sports. And consequently, there's a 10 mile an hour speed limit on the lake. So speed did you do up the lake? 120, 130 miles an hour. I've never actually seen a powerboat race and I've, I've always been impressed with how insanely brave it looks. On the road, you think, well, there's tyres and there's brakes, and it's, it's kind of like something you're familiar with. And when you mm. see these skiffs going so fast, it does look phenomenally dangerous. That's pretty much <laughs> the level of it. Determined not to let the band get in their way, Ted and his fellow boat racing enthusiasts moved 30 miles east, 
to a slightly less glamorous spot, Barrow in Furness. I love going fast and the roar of engines, but I've never tried powerboat racing, so I'm setting the danger aside and throwing caution to the breeze. I'm going for a ride in a boat capable of over 80 miles an hour. Here we go. My life vest is on and the straps are tightening. A <laughs> little too much for my liking. Yes, that's on. Sometimes you just know you're going to regret those rash decisions. Whoa. By which time, it's just too late. My body feels like it's done 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. The constant banging in the floor, the whole floor is going bang, bang, but on my I get Whoa. I think that's enough for me, but the sensation of speed is incredible. The thing that really surprised me is when you go into to the corner like that, yeah. isn't the boat's going to drop or, yeah. or flip over? Safely back on dry land, I joined the spectators to see the club president, Ted, racing in one of the high-speed catamarans. He's right out of the water, look at this, yeah. jeez, oh. oh! These things may be the equivalent of Formula One motors, but this dock is only the size of a supermarket car park. It's great to watch, it's exhilarating fast, and like all motorsports, it's loud. I love it. Well, it says good for the heart to get scared once a day, as my heart's going <laughs> fine, I tell you. This has been an extraordinary experience. It, it does look so dramatic. I, I mean, I know, I know the, the Windermere thing, beautiful, etc. but I think this industrial setting is, is good for a big screamy engine. Here's the thing about the club in Windermere. Everyone was bereft for the loss of the lake, yet when we got to the new place, everyone admitted it was in many ways better. Maybe what people don't like is change. Leaving the industrial dock at Barrow behind, I'm climbing again as the road snakes away from coast and lake into the stunning wilderness. It's absolutely lovely cruising about in an old girl like this, this beautiful remote countryside, these lovely winding lanes that she was designed for. Until you want a cup of tea. And then usually you ask a sheep and the sheep goes, meh. In other words, there isn't one. But in this case, that sheep would be wrong because not half a mile from here is the highest cafe in Britain. Perched at 1,903 feet, Hartside Top Cafe has stunning views, and after that drive, a cup of tea to die for. It's a good job I had that wee pit stop. There are not many cafes on this barren and remote stretch of road. I'm leaving the lakes and green valleys of the northwest for the industrial northeast. Now, on this journey, I've seen many listed buildings. Old churches, stately homes, historic village high streets. But up in Ryehope in Sunderland, I'm off to see something completely different. It's arguably the strangest listed building in Britain. And wait for it, it's a pigeon loft. A listed building, I think it's just fantastic. <laughs> when war come through, I'd be made a listed building. Oh, I was, I was on the moon. <laughs> 75-year-old ex-miner Morris Surtees is a classic northern character. He's been raising pigeons since 1955 when he and his brother built their Cree with scrap wood. Remarkably, Morris managed to get his loft listed 10 years ago when he heard about plans to flatten these allotments and replace them with houses. Its new grade two status not only stopped the development going ahead, it meant he could keep his racing pigeons. Can I see you have dues, as they say in Scotland? Now, I'm no great fan of pigeons, but I've always been amazed at how they can find their way home from hundreds, even thousands of miles away. And tomorrow, the lads have a big race coming up, and they've asked me to choose a bird for myself. Now, there's an invitation. Take your pick. Um, and if it wins, we'll keep the money. Oh, you keep the money. OK, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but what money? Do you fancy that one? Surely. Can I kiss him good luck? Why, aye. This last here. There you go. That'll do. That's yours. We hope for the best for the mother. Keep your fingers crossed. After picking my bird, it's off to the clubhouse to register him and pay my 50 pence entry fee. 
Do you want to put that one in for us, Rory Yos? Go on, I'll give it a shot. Aye. Hi. Good evening. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. He'll be loaded onto a truck tonight with all the other birds and will travel 150 miles south to the start line. But first, my pigeon, Robbie's boy, as I've called him, is tagged along with all the others, so when they fly back, we can tell whose bird is whose. So it's really kind of exciting, isn't it? You think Cheap all these bird. birds tomorrow are going to fly all that way. You get your butterflies in your belly to one of mine. Do you? I bet you do. Just before the gym. With registration completed and the birds tagged, it's time to join the other club members to synchronize all our clocks. When the birds arrive back, the tag on their leg is put through a slot in the top of the clock and sealed, recording the time he lands so no one can cheat. There you are. Spot on. Flying. So we are. So we are. Five flights away. It's seven o'clock the following morning, and the birds are ready at the start line. Up in Sunderland, just as they've done since the early 1800s, men gather at their lofts. You all right, man? You all right, then? You know, you're going to laugh. I was dreaming about pigeons all last night. I was. <laughs> Back at the start, race marshals will release more than 30,000 pigeons. With a good tailwind, they could reach home in just over two hours. <laughs> For Morris, nothing beats the expectation of his bird's return. Although, personally, I'm enjoying this sport because it largely involves waiting around in the sunshine. I should explain that I'm sitting here like a statue because I have to. <laughs> because otherwise the birds might think there's something unfamiliar here, like an enormous orange man. Oh, here you go, here you go. Four, four. Come on, here. Yeah. That is Robin, say that was yours. Thank you very much. Robbie's boy makes it home in two and a half hours, and he fancies a little reward. That dirty. Good that Robbie's boy is safely landed and clearly enjoying himself. But just like at some wartime aerodrome, we're still nervously waiting for the stragglers. I keep thinking of World War II movies where they're waiting for the Spitfires to come back in. No sign of ginger. The lads try to coax their birds down, but they know they haven't won. Reports are already in that the winning pigeon landed 25 minutes ago. But that's the least of their worries. The vulture developers are circling yet again, and they could put an end to the pigeon racing in this area for good. If the wash comes to war, Robbie, uh, or oh, the broken heart lads around there, broken hearted. Our families has been here since 1900. It's a long yeah, time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a long time. Uh, The thing about keeping pigeons is it's always been portrayed as a rather sort of coarse, handicapped kind of northern thing in the media. It's actually a wildly romantic thing. And you think of those guys who spent their lives kind of away at coal fishes and battering in rivets. They bloody needed something romantic to do, to lift their spirits. The whole idea of taking wee birdies 150 miles away and watching them come home, I think is a, well, a wildly romantic idea. And long may it continue. Right. <laughs> Cheer the old lads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God bless. When many people think of the North East, places like Ryhope come to mind. Old mining and shipbuilding communities, an industrial heartland. But it also contains some of Britain's most amazing scenery. I'm back on the road, and as the day is coming to a close, I'm heading into Northumbria. This area of Britain has been fought over for centuries and in the distant past marked the northern frontier of the mighty Roman Empire. In fact, Northumberland has more battlefields and castles than anywhere else in Britain. I'm going to visit Chillingham Castle, which is supposedly the most haunted place in the country. Intriguing. I have to say, it's got the most horrific history. The number of people who were maimed, slaughtered, tormented, thrown in the lake and hanged here, uh, it's just horrific. Previous guests at the spooky 13th century castle have included Edward I, 
James I and, on his way to be chopped up, William Wallace. I'm the latest visitor to check in. Let's hope its owner, Sir Humphrey Wakefield, is less bloodthirsty than his predecessors. Sir Humphrey, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Sorry to get you out here. Um, I understand I'm staying here tonight, am I? You are. I, I very much hope you are. Today, anyone can stay in its haunted rooms, and you could even catch your own dinner. The lakes of the castle's grounds are apparently teeming with brown trout. Three rods for you. Good man. But this place is alive with grisly tales from the past. We're going to take that. The whole of this area was one mass of family feud and, 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 and border feud. Groups of Scots would have come down and all our various torture equipment, man traps and cages, masks and racks, were all put into good use. Perhaps the nastiest inhabitant of Chillingham was a 13th century torturer called John Sage, or Dragfoot as he preferred to be known. The mad tormentor of Scottish soldiers and chancers used to live here. Once he'd done his horrible business, he used to dump the bodies into this lake. A long time ago, we must learn to forgive. I didn't catch anything. I think the thought of all my countrymen lying at the bottom of that lake put me off my stroke. Oh, good man. Didn't seem to affect Sir Humphrey, though. Honey fish. Well done. Oh, yes. That's edible. I'll see. Ah, supper time at the castle. Sir Humphrey has lived here for the last 30 years and is a firm believer in the existence of ghosts and spirits. So much so, he even employed a priest in a bid to scare them off. I said to the priest, can you get rid of the spirits? Mm -hmm. Which is what he did for a living sort of thing. Yeah. And, um... Exorcist. The exorcist. Yeah. He looked round, and at the end of the weekend, he said, no, he said, they're too strong, I can't touch them. Nothing no. we can do with this place, but Mike. But there are famous ghosts here. Yeah. And there's a wedding blue boy, and there's Lady Mary Barclay, and all that. Many visitors to the torture chamber report some kind of ghostly experience. I'm a bit of a skeptic, so I've invited a group of parapsychologists to try to prove that ghosts really do haunt Chillingham Castle. Sensors. And what are they sensing exactly? We're actually looking for anomalous noises that right. it is something we will be able to capture. So let's say, for example, in uh, a room like this where possibly, where we're not sure, many of people have died a horrible death. Do you think there would be some resonance of that? It could be. It could be stored in the brickwork. It could be that the people were so traumatised they don't actually know they're dead. I see. Well, let's hope that comforting little chat won't stop me getting a good sleep. It seems my psychic investigator friends, though, are planning to stay up all night. The next morning, and it's time to see whether the ghost hunters have picked up any rumblings, apart from my own, of course. Well, we did pick up some interesting voices. Did you? Yes. Um, we picked up a voice in the Grey Apartments. When we asked for a name, it replied, Edward. You're kidding. Can I hear Do that? Can hear it? Oh, again, 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 good. Can you repeat the name for us? It does sound like Edward. Mm. It'll be Edward the First. Could be. On his way north to slaughter our people. <laughs> that wasn't heard at the time of recording, um, so that's coming out with our hearing frequency. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't hear it through your ears? No. Yeah. So what do you think, then? Do you think Edward's still hanging about here? It's certainly possible. Well, I have to say that I disagree with you and Sir Humphrey. I'm not convinced at all. But, um, but thank you for showing me what you do, and uh, maybe one day you'll prove me completely wrong. Terrible, terrible things happened around here. The 40,000 troops came down there, 20,000 people were killed here. They piled bodies up down there. It's not surprising that the ghost hunters imagined they were going to find something here. And they did. They found an instrument that said, Edward, in the middle of the night. So you can imagine how convinced I am by that. Uh, but it's been fascinating. It really has been just fascinating. Well, I'm now finally leaving England behind and crossing the border to a country where spectacular mountains brood over wild and scenic rivers 
where the water's cleaner, the air's fresher, the people friendlier. So welcome to Wales. Just kidding. Welcome to Scotland, my homeland, you might say. Uh, the extraordinary thing is that where the line actually goes has been contested almost daily for about 700 years. So this may move tomorrow 100 yards down there or 100 yards that way. Now, normally, if I were driving back home on the vile, stinking M74 motorway, the first thing I'd see would be a towering landmark in the distance. But, seeing as I'm going by the B roads, I can now get up close. This is Chapel Cross, near the Solway Firth. It's Scotland's original nuclear power station, and its 282-foot cooling towers have dominated the landscape since the 50s. But that is about to change. These are magnificent. I've seen these many a time driving yeah. up. Yeah. They're kind of landmark when you hit Scotland, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. But not for much longer? No, no. They've been here 50 years, uh -huh. and uh, Sunday in about 10 seconds they'll all be gone. Dave Wilson's supervising the biggest explosion in the area for years. The site stopped generating electricity three years ago after failing safety checks. Now the towers have to come down. For the town, this must be them sort of losing their church people. It's a sad people. day for yeah. the community when they go. The whole generation growing up with these things Absolutely. on the landscape. Well, like yourself. Yeah, yeah. Remember playing football in the football pitch that used to be out there and yeah. travelling up and down to Cumbria and passing these things. Can we crawl in before it falls down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Is that a technical term? <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, my that was, Lord. That was a door, actually. The towers are bristling with tons of nitroglycerine, already and prepared for the demolition. This is definitely no place for the faint-hearted. Hey! Hey! That's weird. To see this, this is a sight that everyone would love to see. Yeah. Every, every time you walk past these, everyone always thinks, I wonder what yeah. it's like in there, yeah. don't you? Don't you? There's 25 and a half thousand tons of concrete in the four towers. Right. You wouldn't believe all this lot will fit in here, but it well, it'll will. actually fit in this circle. Yes. See in about a thousand years' time when the when the archaeologists are digging <laughs> that little thing. What the? <laughs> <f> <laughs> <is going on? laughs> when the power station was built, it transformed the fortunes of the nearest town, Annan. As well as electricity, it since generated more than a billion pounds to the local economy. For Bill and Mary Thompson, it was also the place they met, fell in love, and started their lives together. So, I mean, this place must have been a huge difference to you, I mean, not just in meeting oh, each other. To our life and lifestyle, yes. Robbie, this was a great kicking off point. And I met Mary there. What, what is that, Bill? What is that? That's you when you were out. In 1959, Bill was a fitter and Mary a canteen worker. And they met when he came to repair the coffee machine. A true Scottish romance. Was, was he a bit shy? It was actually aye, was. Aye. was he? Do you know he blushed something terrible? <laughs> and then just one day he says to me, I'm gonna marry you. I says, Oh Harry, really? Right. And that was right there. <laughs> just in just there. Just in there, in the tea bar. As the countdown to the blast begins, I join Bill and Mary to see a huge part of their past disappear forever. The event is all the more poignant as we watch from the farm where Mary grew up. I wonder if Dad's watching from up there. <laughs> Soon he's chimney. Oh. Your dad, your, your dad. No, no, don't say that. <laughs> he's that. Your dad. Well, did he not like them? No. No, I bet he didn't. <laughs> yeah. Here we go, here we go. Lordy, lordy, lordy. <laughs> Let it go. Oh, look at him. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Oh. Yo. 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 Lovely, jolly. Sweet. Oh. Oh. There you are. Oh. <laughs> <Hey>? <laughs> oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, darling, I know, I know. Oh, darling. Hey, that's a change. Oh. What an emotion there, Mum. Yeah. Hey. 
it's not often the past just disappears like that, no. is it? No. Usually no. it slips away, doesn't it? Right. It doesn't kind of go bang like that. It's kind of like closing the book up that you've read it, that, isn't it? Perhaps it was seeing Bill and Mary look back on their youth, but I've been inspired to delve into my own past, and the place to do it is here. Dumfries and Galloway, my ancestral heartland. So I'm off to research the Macmillans. My family, which is family name is Macmillan, comes from as far back as uh, my Aunt Greta could find, Glen Truel. So, uh, you know, local family. However, there is another Macmillan around here. Or at least there was. Back in 1839, this place was home to blacksmith Kirkpatrick Macmillan, who is supposedly my great, 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 whatever. Now, shoeing horses is all very well, but if you're a Macmillan, you need to do something a little more creative. That's why in his spare time, the old boy invented the first modern bicycle. Rick Alsop runs the local bike shop and museum, which has a model of the invention that changed the world. But something's rather bugging me. If my ancestor was behind it, where's my inheritance? <laughs> he didn't patent this device, but people saw it and copied it. And for a while, he wasn't even credited as the inventor because there was a chap from Kilmarnock that sold them right. as his own. Well, he may not have left me any money, but Kirkpatrick McMillan did bequeath the love of making things. <laughs> <laughs> so, my pretty, do you or do you not know exactly where the gold is buried? Sorry, it's a bit of a show off there. That's right, so. At the local museum, they're making a replica of Kirkpatrick's original bike, and I asked blacksmith Ross Berry if I could help. Ross, as you can see, is a man you ask very nicely. The Edinburgh socket set. <laughs> Shows. Delicate artistic hands, you know. <laughs> Sore arm in the morning. Not bad. Not for the first time. That's <laughs> dead, eh? I'll be it. That's all right, I ain't got either. It's the most back to front way of cycling in the world. <laughs> it should be. That's it. There you go. Let's turn it that way. Oh, cool. The putting on of the seat. <laughs> so? So, the assembly's completed. It's time for a test ride. All we need is a guinea pig. It's the wobbliest, rickiest thing you'll ever see in your life, but it's amazing how it stays on. It's a stage, isn't it? Right then. Of course, it's not heavy either, is it? No, it's not really heavy. It's what it's made of. Just watch your shins on then. Sure. It's time. <laughs> that looks good. These are a wee bit loose, but... Ah, oh, a bit of glue. A bit of glue. Okay. Right, time for a test ride. Yes, on you go. Fantastic. Is it still hot? No. <laughs> right, off we go. That's amazing, isn't it? That's Can you amazing. Imagine? And, and there wouldn't be a road like that, either. No. It would be, be pre-metalling. It would be just rubbish. Dirt and rocks. Dirt and rocks. And no suspension. He's face fairly going some now, isn't he? Oh, he's off. That's fantastic. Look at him. It may not be as fast or reliable as a modern bike, but back in the mid-19th century, it was a godsend. There must have been some guy. Macmillan once even rode it the 68 miles to Glasgow, taking two whole days, which was very brave when you look at that saddle. Was he ever a father there after, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the Burns, Betty. Now the bicycle. <laughs> It does seem extraordinary that something so simple could have changed history. But it did change history. It changed people's lives. I'm inching ever closer to Glasgow now. But although I'm just 10 miles from the city, you wouldn't think so by the sights or the odors. Oh, oh, and that's lovely country smell. <laughs> oh, boy, the spreading today, Tom. Well, what fragrance do you expect when these boys are around? Tom Thompson's got 360 of them. No wonder he's lost all his friends. The Highland cows? Yes, Highland cattle. Um, one of the oldest breeds of cattle in the world, probably. Are they? Is that uh, so? Yeah. They're, they're a sort of Scottish, uh, slightly camp icon, to Aye, be honest, they're aren't iconic. they? 
But the other thing, of course, is that they'll eat anything. I mean, they, they, they don't need lush grass, do no. they? they? They'll live on heather and... Aye, they'll, they'll thrive on poorer ground. I suppose if you're going to end up being eaten, you don't need to bother about your appearance either. But at the Highland Cattle Club novice fate, looks are all. Here, farmers clean and preen their animals in the cow equivalent of crufts. And today, I'm helping Tom's team prepare. Just run round the cow, just a rough Before you start washing. Before you start washing. Oh, there you go. Take it out. Take any tots or any foreign material from her. When you say foreign material, when you get that way... Yes. Yes. Yes, yes OK. <laughs> I just wondered how... how. Foreign materials safely out the way, it's time for shampoo, conditioner, and a little of that hairdresser's famous small talk. Are you happy with it? Yeah. Careful with your shampoo. Because she get dandruff or does she get fine and fly away? Oh, I'd say fly away. Well, I think we should try Yeah, that. OK. Yep. <laughs> the whole thing about Highland cattle is that they're hardy beasts and they can live on just about anything. And here we are shampooing her. How does that work then? Don't do it on an everyday basis. Bring the cars out and shampoo them and massage them. <laughs> because one simply has to. <laughs> Veteran competitor Liz Shaw comes over to inspect my work. Right. You've done very well because there's no knots in her coat. Got the knots out. You got yeah. the knots out, so I'm impressed. I got the jobbies out the back. But what's the, there's a wee bit of a problem here. Ah. Bubbles left. So, Robert, you'll need to rinse this. Well, there's only so much attention you can give a cow before people start considering you a bit strange. So now I'll take her out and leave the next bit to the judges. Come on, it's okay. I'm not sure my cow appreciates my choice of jojoba and lavender shampoo. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Chill, girl. Chill, girl. <laughs> Whoa, jeez, oh. My beast is getting a bit reluctant and self-conscious, but she's not alone. We were having difficulty here with this cow. No, no interest in moving. No, she's not interested in moving. <laughs> I joined the judge. I think I'm impressing him with my cow knowledge. That's definitely a bull. Yeah. Now it's off to the barn for the judge's decision. Um, it's been a pleasure for all the novices that are here today. Right, fingers crossed. Maybe I should have bribed him. And the third prize goes equally to Tom and Robbie because Robbie did the groundwork and Tom did the show. Well done, the pair of you. Thank you. Well, excuse me, but that's another prize of one of this journey, so I'm feeling rather proud of myself. And I'm also rather proud of my cow. She smells of lavender shampoo and she looks fantastic. Good enough to eat, in fact. Oops, sorry, old girl. No offence. I'm on the final leg of my journey from London to Glasgow, and I can't wait to get back to the city. But first, I can't help taking just a minor detour to a place important to many of us Scots. Well, this is the Castle of Stirling, which is uh, very beautiful and very peaceful these days. It wasn't always so. There's your Wallace monument. Uh, Wallace was the man who first defined the idea of the Scottish nation, which is why he's a bit of a hero. And uh, he battered the English just down there. But uh, we don't do that anymore. We just sneak in the back door and become prime minister. <laughs> I'm in a bit of a dilemma. Driving into Glasgow is normally a very simple business. The M8 plows slap bang into the center of the city. Taking that would be too easy though. The old Jag's done a fantastic job, so I've arranged one last little mission, a last little treat for the old girl. I've asked the lads on the Renfrew Ferry to make a special journey all the way to Glasgow city centre. Joe, hi Robbie, nice to meet you. you. How are you? Welcome aboard the Renfrew. We've got a lovely day for it, haven't we? Yes. A perfect clay <laughs> day, you might say. <laughs> Oh, what a treat to get on the get, get on the Renfrew ferry and head off. The River Clyde, a highly emotive symbol for anyone connected to the city. 
For me, it seems the perfect way to come home. As the saying goes, Glasgow made the Clyde, and the Clyde made Glasgow. See, I get terribly nostalgic in the Clyde, because I can remember going down the Clyde when I was a boy with my dad. He knew people who worked in every single yard. Right. So they always knew when there was a launching, and he would always get me out of school if it wasn't at the weekend, because <laughs> a bit of a family emergency, I'll just take Robin out of school. <laughs> you know, and the next thing I'll be, yeah, beauty! Without the river, Glasgow wouldn't have manufactured over 30,000 ships or exported 18,000 locomotives. You should do this more often. <laughs> You're welcome to do it any time. Oh, I'm a sailor, man. But where do you want to keep her away from? I've always fancied myself as a bit of a mariner. I'll be me. <laughs> Now we're getting to the delicate stuff, I think it's time for you, sir. <laughs> when you go, thanks very much, appreciate Thank you. that. You're welcome. I'm going to burst into that uh, Kenneth McKellar song, if I'm not careful. The Clyde, the Clyde, the oh, wonderful Clyde. But for a pound, I'll stop. <laughs> this is all the new stuff, of course. Well, we're actually heading up to the centre of town now. You can tell because the graffiti is improving. The Clyde is undergoing a massive redevelopment on its way to becoming a remarkable centre once again. Right, that's me, that's me in the centre town. I'll go and change into something a little less country, a little more, well, Glasgow, and uh, go and have what I always have when I first arrive in Glasgow, a nice curry. Glasgow has won the prestigious Curry Capital of Great Britain Award three times. In fact, it was in kitchens like this 50 years ago that Glasgow chefs claimed to have invented the chicken tikka masala. The restaurant I'm in has been part of the curry capital winning team. It's a real family business and chef Sanjeev Sangera is proud that they're representing Glasgow in the competition once more. There's 10 of us in the family alone that work right, here. Right. And it's probably the reason that we're all so enthusiastic about the business. That's probably yeah. why it's became such a success so quickly. Yeah. You know, within a year we were getting accolades. As part of the contest, each restaurant in the competing cities has to run a charity dinner. And that's exactly what's on tonight. The pressure is on, of course, for it to be a success. And with nearly 100 guests attending, it's surely the wrong time to get me to help them cook. But Sanjeev puts me to work and I see that he's not quite as mild-mannered in the kitchen. You almost done? Eh, uh, not quite, no. So then I try the actual cooking of the ingredients, and I think it's going pretty well. One second before you make a mess here. But Sanjeev isn't convinced. Like that, please. Right, OK, right. Don't look. <laughs> the floor's getting a nice tea so far. Sorry. As the restaurant fills up, the pace in the kitchen gets more hectic, and I find out that even frying onions isn't as straightforward as I thought. If we don't keep mixing it, the frying pan's going to burn, sure. and then we're going to have a problem on our hands, OK? So in fact, it's downright dangerous. Stand back a bit, because you'll get flamed if you see it. you show it a second? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll get flamed, OK? So just stand okay, back a little stand bit. Stand back a bit, OK. A long-arm job. Yep. After a bit more help from Sanjeev, I serve up my finished curry. Well, it smells good. So do I get to come back and give you abuse if you don't like it? Please do. <laughs> the perfect accompaniment to any curry is a lovely bit of naan bread. Now, how difficult can that be to make? Just turning into the generation. That's in the bin. Just but a Bruce, Bruce's thing is, didn't he do dreadfully? See? Didn't he do badly? Didn't he do badly? <laughs> <laughs> If I thought that was bad, now I have to brave the 400-degree oven. Lower your hand in and then press it against the wall and just lift and right and then lift your hand out, OK? Doesn't okay. matter if it falls. OK, like this. There you go. <laughs> That's about all I can take. And you know what they say, if you can't take the heat, blah, blah, blah. Well, I tried. And anyway, I don't want to scupper Glasgow's chances of retaining the title. I'll be in tomorrow. <laughs> Hard as that was, it was a revelation. Apparently everyone's tucking in, but I haven't heard how my curry went down. Oh well, as they say, no ambulance is good news. Thank you for helping us uh, in the bid to make Glasgow the curry capital of Britain once again. If there's any complaints about the food, remember it was Robbie that made it. 
So after working the kitchen, burning my hand and watching everyone else eat the competition dinner, I'm finally getting to eat my curry. One thing's for sure, I'll never look at a nan the same way again. That's a very nice shoot, <laughs> It's very tender, you must have cooked that a long time. <laughs> yeah. I have no shame. <laughs> That's just fantastic. So lovely to come home. Well, there you go. What a great curry and what an amazing trip. In a couple of minutes, I'll be pulling into my front drive, thrashing the staff, heading straight for the sofa to put my feet up. On my journey, I've learned a lot and I've laughed with some great people. <laughs> And you know, although Britain seems to be increasingly homogenized and uniform, it doesn't take that much to find people celebrating wonderful and unique things with passion and pride. I've seen some spectacular sights and marveled at the stunning landscape, and none of it is that far from the motorways. So why not turn left rather than right at a junction? Take the B road, the slow lane, and who knows what you might find.